that we have co uh, have come so far, we believe that um, not uh, sufficient, um, not very specific uh, technical guidance in the working party guidelines, uh, together with um, very little um, research and the very um, little rates of exercising the right uh, contribute to the uh, difficulties to enforce the right. Now, um, as I mentioned uh, so far, they have been um, conducted uh, two uh, studies, two bigger studies uh, to exercise the right to data portability, one at the University of St. Andrews and another one at um, the University College London. Uh, we too at NOIB try to exercise the right and here in order to example to, to explain what the main issues with exercising the right uh, of data portability is I will um, de uh, describe the story of my own um, when I try to submit the uh, request for data portability to one of the controllers and when I was um, facing um, multiple issues with with the exercising the right so I I submitted several requests and I'll uh, focus on the one that I submitted to Spotify. Um, the first um, issue I faced when I submitted um, my request was with lack of comprehensive information about how exactly I should proceed with exercising my right. I contacted um, the team via email. I received a, a relatively standard response that I should download my data myself. Um, despite that, I asked the data to be transmitted directly to another controller, which is Apple Music. And um, as a result of receiving such a data set, I was uh, offered a bunch of folders with information stored in the JSON file and um, some in information about the data itself. So at least in this point, it was helpful because I was relatively, um, I was relatively well informed about what I am receiving. Um, what is unfortunate, however, is that Spotify seemed to confuse my request with the, uh, with the access request under Article 15 um, under the GDPR, and that uh, resulted in me receiving uh, more data than I am supposed to receive under the um, data portability right. So here the problem lies in the fact that as a data subject, um, you are expected to know how exactly the data portability works. You're expected to be able to filtered data that you receive and to uh, extract only the data set that um, is within the scope of the data portability right and send it to another controller. Another stone wall that I faced while uh, exercising the right or trying to exercise it was the argument from the controller that it's not technically feasible to send my data either directly to another controller nor was it technically feasible for another controller for the Apple Music to import the data. The problem with the not technically feasible argument is that controllers, when they use it, when they rely on it, they have the obligation to provide more information and to conduct a case by case analysis of why this is not technically feasible for them to send data directly to that one selected controller of mine. Usually controllers do not provide any extensive information on why this is not technically feasible. Um, we are now trying to follow up with controllers and ask more information for them to explain what is not feasible. And uh, the failure to explain um, the details of, what, uh, of why um, this is not technically feasible from the controllers will also result in their breach of another obligation on the information and the transparency obligations under the GDPR. As my example, showcases and it mirrors uh, to a large extent um, the experience of the two research groups who uh, conducted studies on that topic. The right to data portability cannot be successfully and fully exercised by data subjects. Of course, if something is not easy or not possible to exercise, it's also difficult to speak about the enforcement. We do not have the enforcement history by the supervisor authorities or by the courts. We do not really know how these entities interpret the right to data portability. <clears throat> That's why um, within NOIB, we are working on the research that will clarify the notions that create obstacles on the way to exercise the right successfully. And we will focus within our project on clarifying the notion such as technically feasible and the notion of the responsibilities of controllers to understand better what is the main reason why it's currently just a declaration and not a practical tool. 
Thank you, Allah. Um, I've had similar experiences myself with, um, ironically, with Elsevier asking uh, to um, to move my data protection articles from SSRN to um, to another archive. And similarly, Elsevier at first mistook my request for a subject access request. They did, to be fair, then actually put a development team onto um, mm -hmm. expanding their data ac their subject access tool to include all of my data. Um, but then, of course, at the other end, as, as you mentioned and, and others have mentioned, like the UCL group. I have nowhere to upload it. I haven't. I haven't found um, particularly a free archiving, uh, paper archiving tool that has the the upload tool. And similarly with my with the supermarket, the online supermarket I use in the UK. Actually, th they are one of the UK's largest supermarkets, Tesco. They have a very comprehensive um, data portability page on their website, better than I think any other UK business I've seen. So I was able to access my shopping list. But again, wasn't able to actually upload it to any of the other supermarkets um, in the UK that that aren't support aren't supporting this. Perhaps we can we can all come back to this later on. The the practicalities of um, how we actually get organisations uh, support, supporting interoperability. Do we have to do it at one at a time, or are there ways perhaps regulators and others can encourage them? Um, and I th I think our next speaker, Olivier Dion, uh, will have certainly will have views on this. Um, Olivier is founder and CEO of OneCoop, a French startup developing a human-centric personal data sharing infrastructure, and the International Association A New Governance, which promotes the shift to a fair data economy. Olivier teaches innovation at ULCO Calais and Dunkirk, where he has been developing the startup ecosystem since 2014. So first of all, Olivier, I, I believe you founded your um, your startup in 2011. So you've done quite a bit on data portability already. Could you could you give us a bit of background on that? Yes, we um, we started with uh, an American community uh, called uh, Vendor Relationship Management. It was based in uh, Harvard, but uh, there was the idea already uh, of uh, empowering people with their uh, with their data. Uh, but then uh, a bit later came um, the building of, uh, of GDPR, of the GDPR, and uh, and we worked very early, uh, very uh, early on on the on the right to portability with um, with the French CNIL, uh, and uh, and yes, it was hard to build the right to portability uh, because it's a um, right, it, it's regulation before innovation. We had no idea about how uh, it should be uh, implemented um, for, for real in the, um, in the market. And uh, we saw it in, in 2018 uh, at the moment uh, of the, uh, the GDPR enforcement. And uh, what we did with, uh, with, OneCube, with OneCube at this precise moment, we uh, run uh, a test. We took um, some of our users to send requests for portability to 6,000 um, French companies. We automated the process and we uh, almost got no answers. So it was just two months after uh, GDPR and, uh, and companies obviously were not ready. And then we interrogated them and uh, uh, realized that for companies, there were um, um, portability was just a compliance issue. That was a problem. And in fact, if you have a closer look at it, there are two situations with portability, uh, two uh, use cases, families, we could say. Um, one is competition portability, is uh, I ask for a company to transfer my data uh, to a, a, a competitor. Let's say uh, I want my playlist uh, into Deezer to be transferred to uh, Apple Music or Spotify. And uh, there is another family, which is, we, could, we could, could call it cooperation portability, where you want to transfer your data from uh, one service to a complementary service. So let's say sp your Spotify playlist to uh, uh, a ticket uh, selling, uh, a, a concert ticket uh, website. So that, those are two very different situations, and all the companies we were talking to at that moment were only seeing the competition 
uh, use case, not the cooperation use case. And so they didn't want to foster data portability. Uh, they, they did not want to advertise on it. And uh, the result was that uh, their users just didn't know about it and what to do with their data. There were no concrete use, case, use cases uh, attached to the right to portability. And uh, so our view now is that we've got to push more on complementary cooperation use cases for portability. This is uh, with business incentives, this is the best way we believe to foster the creation of uh, personal data sharing infrastructure uh, behind it. And, um, and then uh, we'll have, organization will not be able to say what they say today that uh, if I look at article 20, it says when technically uh, feasible, uh, we, we need to have this infrastructure uh, format standards, interoperability uh, protocols, and uh, we don't have it. So we believe we get to push more on the cooperation, uh, business incentives, uh, use cases. And, um, and the other thing is um, how to do it concretely. So um, the different options are uh, direct transfer or the indirect transfer. Indirect transfer mean, means that the user will uh, take data, its data uh, either in an Excel spreadsheet or in a personal data store, and then we'll push uh, back data to uh, another uh, data controller, another service. Um, the other way to do it is direct transfer. I ask for one service to send my data directly to another service. And we think it's better. It's a better solution. Uh, but if you do this, you get to base data transfer on consent. So this, there is an architecture and an infrastructure to build behind this. And we believe what we are seeing today with uh, the Digital Markets and Services Act and also the Data Governance Act are a very important step, steps toward the building of this new uh, infrastructure. Thank you, Olivier. Um, okay, we've our first three speakers have focused on portability, um, but our fourth speaker, uh, we can now also bring in interoperability. So, uh, Christoph Schmon is EFF's International Policy Director with a focus on international copyright law and online intermediary liability. He previously led the consumer rights team at the EU consumer organization Bayek, litigated in the Austrian courts, and holds a PhD in law. Christoph, um, EFF and others are, are, have been really em emphasizing a right to interoperability in the Digital Services Act and Markets Act. Can you tell us why you think this is important, please? Sure, and hello, everybody. Um, as Ayn said, I would like to, to bring the discussion in context of political developments, which are the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act proposals, which have um, been recently presented by the European Commission. The idea is to regulate online platforms and create a different online experience for users. Um, I think Rosanna has already kicked off by saying that data portability and interoperability are interconnected. They share a certain similar idea, this idea of control over data, right, and control over online experiences. But if you look at the internet today, then, then we see that something is wrong. That it's not so much to us, but it's more to, to powerful platforms to decide over the destiny of our data. I like to call those huge gatekeeper platforms data silos because they have monopolized the internet with, um, with user data and they've marginal, marginalized alternative platform governance models. So both data portability and interoperability. So interoperability is the idea to make the core services of large online platforms work with those of other platforms come from this idea of giving more freedom and control to users. And at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, we believe that, you know, it's our lives and it should be up to us to decide what to do with our data, whether to access them, to download them, to upload them, to manipulate them, or to move the data to another place. And data portability is a very important step in our journey to, uh, towards a more interoperable internet. It's super important for user autonomy, but if we think about our panel title today, which is, whether we can actually achieve freedom for users, then I think that data portability alone is not quite good enough. 
even if the GDPR rights were properly enforced and even if they were more encompassing as they are now. I don't think they would break up the world at gardens platforms have become. And I want, would like to give an example. Let's, let's assume that I'm fed up with Facebook. I want to move to another, perhaps more privacy friendly platform. This would also mean to leave all friends behind who have not switched. So data portability does not really help. Um, I guess it's, that's an experience that many of us share with some friends and family members. And the same might be true actually for our friends. They don't switch because we are still there. And the more people are on the platform, the harder it will be to switch. That famous network effect. So the result is that at the end, everyone is locked up in the same, in the same few platforms who have ultimately um, control and they are in charge of our data and experiences. And as we learned from Olivier, startup and smaller competitors will have a very hard time to get, a, to get off ground. And this is the second perspective to data portability or interoperability. It's not only about user control, but we can also look at it through the lenses of market competition. Currently, there are just not enough options for users and not enough options to move between services as such. This is why we are pushing so hard to get an interoperability mandate into the Digital Services Act, which is, as, as I explained, it has been presented by the European Commission recently. It's the reform of current internet legislation in Europe. Um, imagine an internet where platforms would actually be forced to provide through a technical interface an option that other services can interoperate with their core services, such as, such as a messenger. The moment you do that, companies would start to actually be concerned that the users could switch at any moment if they're unhappy with the service. Or imagine an internet where users could delegate certain functions, think of content moderation, think of privacy setting, that they could delegate those functions to trusted third parties. Online platforms may start to actually be concerned about whether dark patterns pay off or whether the way of spreading polarizing content is the best way forward. If they must be concerned that users could start to calibrate their own filters for hate speech and misinformation. So in this sense, data portability, back-end interoperability and delegability would be a great floor for an interoperable internet with more market competition. For a ceiling, we would also need to discuss how to dismantle the legal options for companies to protect the data from outside intrusion because big platforms don't like having um, companies talking on the APIs and start to use interoperable services. So they use copyright laws, they use technical anti-circumvention rules, terms of service restriction and so on and so forth to stave off competition. For us, it's clear that such an interoperability mandate must come with principles on privacy and security and documentation. So what we did is to formulate an entire set of principles on how this could look like. And we made the suggestion how the legal provision on interoperability could look like. So as you mentioned, we were rather disappointed that the European Commission, although they announced at several occasions that they share this idea of an interoperable internet, that now if you look at the Digital Services Act package, we see that the Commission made some promising first step, but they did not go quite at the last mile. So our call for the European Parliament is now to stick to the guns and make their own reports, which had suggested interoperability um, provisions, a legal standard and with this call for sticking, stick to your own guns, um, I would like to end my intervention. Thank you, Christoph. Um, and so uh, that leads perfectly to our final speaker, uh, who is Dita Harana Zavar. Dita is a Czech member of the European Parliament and the Vice President of the EP, uh, part of the Renew Europe Group and a member of the Parliament's Internal Market mm -hmm. Committee, which will lead on the Digital Markets Act and Digital Services Act. Dieter also holds a PhD in economics. Um, Dieter, thank you for joining us. Um, I wonder if, firstly, you could respond to what you've heard about what the current situation is, and with this DSA package that the Parliament is now considering from the Commission, your view of what the of what your committee and the European Parliament as a whole considers important. 
Thank you very much and thank you for having me here uh, and also thank you for, for pronouncing correctly my family name. It doesn't happen so often and I know it's complicated Czech family name. So, so I was really, uh, I was pl pleased to hear a good pronunciation of my name. But uh, back to the topic uh, uh, and I was uh, listening very carefully to the experts comments and uh, especially what Christoph said because actually he made a good bridge between what we have currently uh, in, on the table implemented GDPR rules and now the new legislation that was uh, proposed by the European Commission uh, and in this regard especially when it comes to Digital Market Act. So, um, firstly, I think uh, the, the, the previous speakers are absolutely right saying that the current rights under the GDPR don't help data portability, let alone interoperability. I am a huge fan of free flow of data and sharing of data, better portability, better interoperability are the way to, to, to share data. But at the same time, and I think it was Rosanna who already mentioned it, um, there is no such things as a, as a free lunch, as we say. So uh, there are costs that come with creating the digital software to, to port data from one uh, service to another. But there are also risks, potential risks for, for the consumers, security risks, but also uh, um, the, the fact that I might feel misled, scammed uh, into sharing information. So uh, what, what we see now is that the GDPR in fact gives the, 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 port the right for portability, but uh, at the end of the day it will be Digital Market Act that will actually help to make it work. Uh, I think Commission understood it well, so we see it in the Digital Market Act. Uh, we, we have uh, an Article 6, which is actually the proof of it. Uh, but we are actually limiting these requirements to those gatekeepers that have the, the, the money to pay for it, the, the, great, the creators, uh, workers to create these tools, and you, you are giving access to the largest source of data. Um, but uh, uh, as I always say, the devil is uh, in the detail and here we have to be honest that for the moment, as, as the, the proposal of the Commission stays, so the, the Article 6 is very general list, uh, the points on portability and interoperability are basically in two sentences. Uh, on interoperability, it is only referred in terms of auxiliary services, installing apps and app stores. I think Christoph already mentioned it, so by law I will be able to install Google Pay on my iPhone, but uh, for some in the Parliament it might not be actually enough in terms of interoperability. Uh, on portability, gatekeepers are required to create tools to help users to port data, uh, but by the terms tools, we get a reference to the creation of a real-time API. In terms of details, that's it. So uh, the article is drafted uh, for the moment in such a way that each and every point will have to be negotiated between platforms and the Commission. So in practice, there is no requirements for some wide single standards uh, between different players. So we might end up in the situation that Facebook and Google tools may be very different. And uh, I don't know if the Parliament will accept this. Uh, when it comes to the Parliament, we are just at the beginning to, to trying to figure out who will do what. For the moment, it's our committee, the Internal Market Committee, that is on the lead. Uh, but uh, it will take us some time to discuss internally our position. Uh, and also there is a parallel discussion happening uh, in the Council among the Member States. While I personally hope we uh, be able to move uh, quickly uh, because uh, we see a lot of Member States actually acting 
alone, France and Germany, uh, we have to be also realistic. It's a huge digital reform of the, in the European Union, so we have to get it right. And I'm happy for the inputs that I can already now collect from different stakeholders. So I will stop here for the moment and happy to follow up later. Thank you. Thanks, Dieter. That's, that's really useful to, to hear about what the, the Parliament is doing and where it, it's focusing. Um, do remember everyone that's watching online, we are eager to hear your questions, which you can submit through the online chat. I'm going to do one more brief round of the panel and then we can move into a more interactive um, mode. So it's, I'll go back to Rosanna, first of all. Rosanna, um, the GDPR has been in force now for, for several years. Um, what do you think would, you know, for people who are impatient to, uh, to start using their data portability rights uh, more effectively, perhaps, what, what could be done quickly? Is this something regulators should, should take more act action on? As you, as you mentioned, the, the European Data Protection Board issued guidance, but it's not particularly specific. Do you think we need more technical detail? Do you think we need enforcement action from the regulators? Do you think we need some big companies to, um, to, to sort of take, take, a, take a leap and uh, demonstrate how useful this can be? Yeah, so uh, I think that uh, probably in this kind of context, uh, we should adopt a multimodality approach in the sense that uh, uh, it's important to find uh, the uh, uh, right options and maybe try to combine them. However, uh, the problem is that usually the quickest uh, um, solution is not always the, the best one, or at least in my opinion, I think that still we need some uh, uh, background uh, work in the sense that, uh, um, that the fact that the right to the portability is not fully developed is under the, eye, uh, the eyes of uh, everyone. Uh, it has been stressed by the other panelists and it is this stressed by the European Commission uh, on the, um, in the communication on the two years of application of the GDPR uh, last, uh, last summer. A first uh, uh, issue is about uh, the lack of standards. And so given that there are no standards, operators stress the difficulties in complying with, uh, with Article, uh, with article uh, 20. Uh, and then there are also intrinsic limitations due to uh, the legal uncertainty of the application of, uh, of, this, uh, of this right. And uh, yes, I was mentioning already two examples. I think that it will be very important to uh, clarify, uh, to, to go on the guidelines issued by the European Data Protection Board. Probably an update would be very much needed uh, uh, considering that data portability is a highly technical uh, right. Uh, uh, and so uh, to have a clearer framework uh, about the kind of different data that can be ported, because only if we have this kind of information, then uh, the platforms have also, uh, well, the gatekeepers <laughs> in this case, uh, will have also the possibility to um, design the system in a way to respond uh, in a quicker way to the response of uh, of data subjects. So what's actually covered by that? Uh, uh, everything, only the data actively provided by the data subjects or the data observed, like web tracking from wearable devices uh, and so on. There are opposite views on, uh, on, this, uh, on this point of view. Uh, what about data generated by other data subjects about me, like uh, rating and rankings, uh, for example, are not covered by the right uh, to data portability. And this could be an issue for people that, for example, would like to port the, um, the, the rating uh, on, uh, on another platform. So, from one accommodation sharing platform to another in order to maintain my, my reputation online. And then a third issue that I think is also important to clarify in order to build trust in this system is about how to port data which embeds other data subjects data. So the problem of third party is true that there is a balancing clause in Article 20. So it's possible to exercise the right to portability as long as it's not adversely affect the rights 
of others. However, I think that there are some interesting challenging uh, regarding uh, what I called uh, the pluricided data. So data that are that concern uh, more people at the same time, and it's impossible to separate them. So it would be actually really interesting to understand from a technical point of view uh, what level of granularity would be possible to reach for identifying the different data subjects um, um, con uh, relating to, to the same data and try to uh, extract only the uh, relevant uh, information. I'm thinking about, for example, this uh, uh, video recording. Uh, it's a video that contains uh, several personal uh, uh, data, the pluricided uh, uh, data, or an Alexa record that records the voices of two people in the same room. So it would be interesting to see uh, how can we ensure uh, that the minimum uh, uh, level of data is actually ported and shared later. So I think that the, this clarification about the scope of application of the right to portability are not just the theoretical issues, but then they are crucial if we want to go to give clear guidance to the uh, SMEs or uh, controllers that has to implement them. Thank you, Rosanna. Um, let me ask a particularly tricky question to Ala. Uh, which I, I warned everyone yesterday I would um, I would ask because I think it is one of the most difficult questions actually about data portability and interoperability. Um, and Ala, you're especially well placed to answer it because you work for a, a civil society group that campaigns to protect people's privacy. Um, where should the limits lie, if any, on data portability and interoperability? So I've I've seen some very interesting examples online um, that uh, perhaps some people might think, mm, I'm not sure I would want to uh, be able to share my data this way and, or to be put in a position where I'm, I'm, I'm strongly incentivized to. Um, and, and I'm thinking especially of ad, ad tech, advertising, profiling of people. Um, what what kind what kinds of limit on ad tech perhaps on health health insurance um you can imagine advertising companies would love to have access to all of my bank records and health records and other kinds of data about me um do you think personally that uh, we should leave it up to individuals to decide should it all be about consent or should there be some some bright lines in the portability and interoperability rights thanks a lot Ian, for this question uh, indeed uh, it's, uh, it's a very um, complex question we can discuss it at length uh, from many different perspectives well i'll, I'll start um, by the way from um, discussing the ad tech environment because it's one of the hottest topics uh, currently and yesterday the Norwegian Data Protection Authority actually issued a, an advance notice on uh, its intention to fine Grindr um, and um, to impose a 10 million, almost 10 million euros fine on them for precisely the reason that Grindr shared uh, personal data of its users with um, the vendors in the ad tech environment and um, there was no legal basis to do that. Of course, we are all concerned about such cases and uh, we as NOIB and many other civil society groups, we have, uh, we, have uh, we, we keep our eyes open and we make sure that uh, whenever um, these cases occur, we bring controllers um, uh, to, uh, to justice and uh, in my opinion, to be honest, the question about the attic environment is a very hypothetical question because uh, what uh, what data subject theoretically will want uh, to take their data uh, from one vendor and um, send it, say, to another vendor? Like, what added value will there be? Um, of course, for the attic environment itself, uh, there is an untapped uh, resource uh, and the untapped wealth. Uh, behind such uh, data but for the data subject um, themselves there there is no um, there are no incentives to do that um, of course when it comes to the legal basis um, on which such data is processed by the ad tech companies there we have to ask themselves do are they even controllers in such cases many of them they don't uh, um, admit their controllers they actually use um, 
um, uh, some really vague formulations. Sometimes they explicitly say they're processors. And in this case, of course, the right to data portability will not apply to them. Um, and some, um, they admit their controllers, in, in which case, of course, uh, as a user, you can ask them to send data to another controller. But uh, in my opinion, uh, legally, that would be uh, possible, but uh, practically, um, I don't see any added value. Now, when it comes to the health sector, of course, it's uh, every time up to the data subject to decide what they want to share and how they want to send it. But uh, we should remember about uh, the principles, the basic principles under the GDPR, and there is the principle of purpose limitation and uh, the data minimization. And these, I believe, are the two main um, um, uh, instruments, the tools that help uh, control this chaotic environment. And of course, when it comes to the uh, receiving controller, let's say that a miracle happens and the receiving controller will accept the data set that uh, a user wants to send to them, that the user wants to import. In this case, the data controller that receives the data has an obligation not to process the data uh, that is excessive uh, for the new processing. So the data, the, the obligation on the receiving controller is to filter the data set that they receive and exclude all the data that is above the, the bare um, necessary for this processing. So I think in this in this sense um, we are safe enough. Um, at this point, we should really tackle the problem of the receiving controllers not having any incentives, not having any commitment to accept data sets. And it's uh, it's a sad fact because we are talking about really big companies that um, hold all the data um, on their platforms currently, um, and. Um, the lock-in effect, the network effect are the main, the main problems for the data subject to have more control and to be more empowered um, to use their personal data to the best um, extent possible. So I'm not sure if I addressed your question um, fully, Ian, so let me know if you have any follow-up questions. Um, that will that. be all from my side. Great. Um, to everyone watching online, I'm not sure that the online chat function is working because I'm not seeing any um, at this end. And at least one person I know who's watching has messaged me privately with a, with a question, which is fine. Um, you don't have to know me personally to ask questions in this uh, session. Um, perhaps we can try Twitter. If you use the hashtag interoperability, I will also watch on Twitter for, um, for tweets with questions. And we still have 22 minutes. So I'm hoping that uh, we'll have um, more than one question. Um, Christoph, let me follow up from what Ala was saying, because I know this is something you and EFF are working on as well. And perhaps this could be uh, a good moment also thinking very specifically about legislation and what Dieter and her colleagues in the European Parliament should be asking the, you know, the Commission and others as they, uh, as they examine these proposals. Um, do you, is it, you're, you're, a, you're a, a, an expert on European law more generally also. Um, Will we, you know, will the GDPR and related privacy rights be enough to protect people's uh, data under portability and interoperability rights? Or do you think the DSA and DMA, if they extend portability and interoperability, are, are those acts going to need further privacy protections also? Perhaps the first question we need to ask ourselves is whether there is an actual privacy issue when it comes to interoperability. And if so, what can we do against it? I think that companies have traditionally shared data with whomever they want, um, whenever it benefits them, often to the detriment of users. We just need to think of the current awful ad tech ecosystem, and we just learned about um, the recent enforcement action by the Norwegian Consumer Council against Grindr or the enforcement action by Noid. It's all against companies who do not care that much about data, right? So. Um, let's just be careful to not enter into strawman arguments by platforms why interoperability cannot be done because of privacy concerns when the opposite is true. We need interoperability so that users can escape the privacy dilemma, which is choosing between friends and disclosure of information. The, the user should be able to better choose platforms that respect the privacy or third parties that help, help them to manage the content feeds. So let's say if users want to leave Facebook in favor of diaspora or Twitter, 
or Twitter in favor of Mastodon, or they would like to move to move to a future no trusted software of some kind and stay in touch with their friends and followers who did not switch. I don't see any compelling reason why this should not be permitted and let alone because of privacy reasons. That being said, it is clear that if we go for a mandatory interoperability um, clause in the Digital Markets Act or Digital Services Act, this will cause companies to share data that they otherwise would not have shared. So Dieter is correct when she said that those new data flows could be concerned because of course, we don't want to put another awful tech and data industry over the one that we already face. So what we would like to have from the perspective of EFF is a good kind of interoperability that focuses on the user interest and not on the bad kind of interoperability. Um, if you think of, of the Cambridge Analytica example or other examples, which are actually, in my opinion, just privacy scandals and not interoperability scandals. So if you put this thing in a the law, there are solutions and safeguards, and I will be quick to describe them. Um, first, the, the lawmakers or the parliament now must make sure that any data that flows over these new interfaces um, are subject to strict privacy protection, and most importantly, rules on data minimization and consent. We have those things in the GDPR, data minimization, purpose limitation, and consent, but what we could do is to um, concretize them in the framework of the Digital Services Act or Digital Markets Act. So to explain what it means, um, consent, what data minimization means when it comes to interoperability. Um, the result should be that any data collected through those interfaces should not be put to secondary commercial use. And second users should have an actual choice to decide whether to start or not to start interacting with another platform. And we know that the question of what constitutes an actual choice is a uh, recurrent question, and I think we could use the DSA to make clear how such a choice must be presented. And second, I also think that we need more scrutiny over platforms, particularly those who choose to modify interfaces. Um, so if we go for interfaces and if we think of standards, although we're not a big fan of it, those, those interfaces must be easy to find, they must be well documented and transparent. So I think if we do all this to basically breathe life into the GDPR provisions on data minimization, on consent, and think of scrutiny of our platforms. If we do all this, then I think we should be fine. Thank you, Christoph. Um, which brings me nicely again to, uh, to Dieter. Um, Dieter, you, you mentioned already the, the limit in some of the Digital Markets Act provisions to ancillary services. Um, We've heard a lot in the news in the last week or two about the the change of WhatsApp's terms and conditions, and uh, a lot of a lot of WhatsApp users saying, "Oh, we we're not happy with this. We want to move to to Signal or Telegram or other um, other instant messaging services." Of course, Facebook, uh, especially during the pandemic, has seen its user numbers rise ever further. I think they're now over three billion monthly active users of, of Facebook social messaging tools. Is competition in particularly social media and instant messaging something that you and your colleagues are looking to strengthen perhaps in the um, in the DMA to say it should not just be ancillary services where interoperability is required, but the, the core services like social media and instant messaging? Can you hear me now? Okay, so here I'm back. <laughs> um, thank you, Ian, for... ...your speaker on GDPR and where we need more when we talk now about how to secure better 
portability and interoperability. I would just say that I always regretted that uh, in eyes of many GDPR was basically seen uh, or portrayed as something to, to protect uh, and limit sharing. I think the contrary should be the, the true because it sh the, the goal was to set up the rules so we trust the system and if we trust the system we will actually share more so that's the short comment to previous discussion on gdpr to your question how far we go with the digital market act whether we uh, should focus not only on the auxiliary services but also to uh, core services the, the the answer is it's not foreseen in in, in the draft uh, of the commission to 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 really focus on the core services uh, beyond maybe the real time api requirements um, I, I view the Commission's proposal saying that if we open to auxiliaries, then users will uh, feel less locked and uh, uh, then it might risk uh, uh, trying to, to switch knowing that the portability requirement will help them switch. So it's about giving consumers a choice, but not really a push to, to switch. So, uh, and also I really like the example you gave uh, on, on WhatsApp and a lot of people, the massive uh, migration now to, to switch uh, to, to Signal. I think that the most important here is to see whether we really need a law when we see that people are switching from one system to basically identical one, but it's a social uh, decision. It, it was based on the social movement. It was our private decision. So I, I, I very much also hope that this is the example that uh, will prove that we uh, that there is perhaps no reason to really focus on core services and have it limited in the Digital Market Act as it stands. Thank you, Dieter. Uh, okay, I'm gonna, we have 13 minutes. Uh, let's see how many of the questions that um, have been asked in the Q&A we can get through. Um, let me first ask uh, Rosanna. Rosanna, I think you, you, you briefly mentioned this, quest, this issue before, but if you could say a little more about it. Um, often porting my, in quotes, data implies porting other people's data as well, and this is problematic. An, off, uh, an argument often raised by controllers to oppose portability, giving the example of Facebook's white paper. Um, do you think, briefly, this is a, a problem we can get over? And, and actually, from what I remember from Facebook's white paper, one, one thing they suggest, and I'm interested if you think it's a good idea, is the option to limit the recipients of, of ported data to organizations that meet some baseline security and privacy standards? Um, yeah, that, that's an interesting point. It's an interesting proposal also because the European Data Protection Board in the famous guidelines uh, essentially said that uh, there is no uh, liability regarding Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, uh, there was some uh, interference. So, um, yes, uh, I was saying that uh, um, um, the, the European Data Protection um, uh, Board uh, essentially did not place any responsibility on the on the data receiver. Uh, um, but uh, anyway, uh, as also Allah was mentioning, I think that the general data protection uh, uh, regulation principles will apply anyway. So uh, accu the accuracy principle, the data minimization principles, the purpose limitation principles, I think that these, these are going uh, in any case to uh, ensure the lawfulness of the, of the processing. So um, I don't think that uh, um, uh, the, again, unless the portability of third party right does not uh, uh, affect uh, 
excessively uh, the, the other party, the, the, this should not be an excuse for the controller to uh, impede the data portability of the, of the data. Thanks, Rosanna. Okay, next, um, a question for Christoph. Um, Christoph, could you say a little more about your and EFF's ideas about delegating content moderation and other tasks to trusted third parties? Sure, I think I should be unmuted now. Um, I think that we started from this thinking um, that we need to acknowledge that users may want to, to leave an incumbent platform, but perhaps they don't, don't want to be burdened with dealing with another 100 privacy or content moderation settings. Perhaps they would prefer to actually delegate certain services to third parties they trust. This is why I had mentioned Noid, because Noid could come up with a, you know, uh, an idea to install a third body um, software run by Noip, which comes with guarantees for user protection and privacy protections. So what users could do if they want to, they could delegate a third body company or a piece of third body software. I mentioned the example of Noip to interact with a platform on their behalf. Or in other words, it would require platforms to allow a third body software to interface with the systems in the same way users do. So if you had this, then users could have the options to see, let's say, news feed in a different order, but it could calibrate their own filters. Um, so in this sense, you have the options that users get in charge themselves over how they perceive content, how they see content uh, over privacy settings. And they could do it with trusted bodies um, where, where users have or share the sentiment that they know better. They know better what is best for the privacy protection or they know that they have a very good idea into um, a good idea about how to avoid harassment online, those sort of ideas. And we believe if you had this back and interoperability and delegability, we call the thing delegability, um, then this could create an entire new ecosystem of new services. You see, you don't need to move the competitor, but you could move to, to could delegate functions to a third party. And then perhaps you get rid of the content that triggers your attention. Perhaps you have better privacy settings or perhaps you just don't need to deal with it because you know there's an NGO who takes care of this. So that's just an additional option which we believe leads to more federation and more user control ultimately. We know that this goes quite far and <clears throat> it perhaps comes with the most potential to cause certain harms if it's not done right. Um, but this is something we would like the European Union to reflect upon. If when, but it isn't a moment now in, in, in time to say, we need to have the options of federation using third bodies that we can actually trust. And that would be an argument against those who say that we just have an additional privacy concern if we move the data to another company. So the argument would be, okay, I don't, I don't do that, but I use a third body I trust. Thanks, Christoph. Um, okay, Olivier, a question for you. Um, you, meant, you mentioned you had, you, uh, you had moved from focusing on com competitive services to uh, cooperating services. We had a question from someone saying, I can't see how this serves the very purpose of having a right to data portability. That is that we are not forever attached to a service. Um, I would, I would add my, uh, so I'll come back to you in a second for, you, for your answer to that, but I would add as well, if you, if you have any thoughts on this is, this is a debate as well on interoperability, should interoperability be about complementary services or should it be about enabling competition in services? What do you think about that? Okay. So this is a, a very important question. Uh, and uh, I realized this, uh, over years, uh, trying to convince organizations to uh, to allow the, the flow of personal data. Um, the thing is that we've got to build cables, whether uh, you have intermediaries like my startup or not, we've got to build cable cables for uh, personal data to circulate. And then on those cables, there will be situations when it's in the company's best economical interest to share data and some other cases where they will not want to share data. And on those, uh, on the second category, then you've, you have regulation that will say, okay, you must share data uh, in this case because it's, it's a matter of uh, users' protection. But those are the same cables. 
just two different situations. Sometimes they, they want it, some, sometimes they do not want it. Uh, and um, we did it, to me, we did it the wrong way. Uh, we Regulation asked for all companies to just share data anytime, but we didn't have the cables. We first have to build the cables and then uh, use regulation for cases that where we are stuck, where, where users, uh, um, where, where companies do not want to play the game and, uh, and will hinder uh, data portability. So data portability, we should have, um, um, we should have built the cables before and then uh, state where uh, regulation has to intervene. That's my view. Thanks, Olivier. And I think actually it, it's a, a reminder also that um, uh, w the, the, the EU is not only limited to law and to creating rights. Of, of course, the European Commission can and does support uh, the creation of this kind of infrastructure. You're talking about the software, the, the standards to, to make these things work in practice. That brings me nicely to Rosanna. Um, Rosanna, we've got a couple of questions about the pay second payment services directive. And in particular, because this is an, an interest, PSD2 um, is an interesting sector specific example of interoperability and particularly in the UK. Uh, so you like me have lived in uh, another another EU member state and the UK um, and an open banking in the UK is actually very developed now. Um, you know, I can see on my phone, I can, I can look at my bank account with one bank using a different bank's app. I can send payments using a payment transfer system from one app directly connected to my current account with a different bank. Is this, is open banking something that, um, that you've looked at and do you think it provides useful lessons for broader interoperability demands? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, I think that we should definitely look at the P, PSD2 directive in the sense that uh, there the mandatory access and interoperability is already implemented. So uh, I think that it's a good model where we can learn uh, in which context the mandatory interoperability can work um, and see whether it can be exported to other sectors as well. Of course, we have to uh, consider the transplantation of the system to, to other sectors, but I think that uh, that might be an interesting spillover effect of this, uh, um, of this kind of systems to, 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 to other sectors. Thank you, Rosanna. Okay. We are almost out of time, um, so what I'm going to do is just very, very briefly, max 30 seconds if each of our panelists um, in, uh, in the same order we've gone. Uh, sorry, Rosanna, you'll be first. Um, yeah. If you have anything final you'd like to say before uh, we close the session, thanks to everyone who submitted their questions. Sorry I couldn't quite get through all of them, but perhaps we can also continue this discussion on Twitter later. So, Rosanna, any final thoughts? Yeah, yeah, uh, very, very quickly. Uh, I would like just to stress uh, that I'm happy to see in the DMA uh, the uh, a nice addition about the continuous and real time uh, portability of, uh, of data. I think that's a uh, uh, really interesting thing to consider and it's going to enhance the efficient of portability, especially in smart environments. Great, perfect. Um, Ala? Um, yes, from <clears throat> From my side, uh, I'd like to add that um, also we are looking forward to seeing how the new uh, data strategy package is going to develop and how it will uh, be adopted in the final version. Um, for us, uh, at the moment, we focus on the GDPR only and um, what uh, we are happy to see that interoperability is becoming a mandate right now. Um, we hope to see the interoperability standards um, develop more and more. And that will hopefully bring the desired effect of the data portability being the real tool, the tool that you can exercise and actively use. And uh, within the enforcement action at NOI, we will try to clarify the remaining um, obstacles like the responsibilities of controllers, the scope of the data that uh, the data subject can move from one service to another, as well as the technically not feasible. Wonderful. Olivier? Uh, um, I'm looking forward to, to seeing the um, uh, data strategy package uh, being uh, um, 
play down and um, to see the, the building. I, I believe we are building this data sharing infrastructure now thanks to this uh, package. And uh, I'm also looking forward to, to, to seeing the, the way we will reinterpret GDPR with this new uh, data sharing infrastructure. Things we will have to uh, think differently when we will have the cables. It, maybe it should have been done the other way around, but that's the way it is. And, uh, uh, and it will be a, a very important step now. Great, thank you. Christoph. I think if we just look at the recent events um, that includes the removal of the Trump accounts and so on and so forth and all the hatred that has surrounded those actions, um, I think that we see that it's much easier to monetize polarization and hate speech than to go for civic um, discourse online. And I guess what we need to do is to change this equation, right? Let's make it harder um, um, to monetize um, polarization and work on fixing the platforms with content moderation, transparency, targeted ads, and let's try at the same time to fix the internet through data border building and, inter and interoperability so that users actually have a choice if they are let down by platforms. So that would be uh, that would be my call. Great, thank you, Christoph. And then finally, Dieter, your last thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I think uh, we are really in a historical moment because we are going to, to shape, change the internet uh, as we know it today. So, uh, and I very much hope that we can continue the discussion and involvement of the, the stakeholders uh, in, uh, during the, the months ahead of us because we need you, we need your, your views because we, I think we have one common goal to get it right. So thank you for organizing uh, the, this event. And I think uh, that we should continue in this discussion further on. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you to all our speakers. Thank you to everyone that listened in and asked questions. And hopefully this session will be published on YouTube so you can listen back for details. And we look forward to continuing this conversation. Goodbye. Goodbye.